All right, first, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present my research today. Uh, despite being at such an early stage, I think that the framework and techniques that I'll talk about hold a lot of promise for advancing our knowledge about the pathogenic mechanisms in HD. Uh, so I'm going to talk about um, some work that I've been doing in postmortem brain imaging and juvenile Huntington's disease. Next slide. So I'll start by discussing and attempting to synthesize a broad range of views on the pathogenic mechanisms in HD in general and discuss how this framework can account for the differences we observe in relation to juvenile onset cases. I'll talk about the limitations that our current standard methodologies have in directly assessing these pathogenic mechanisms and this will provide my logic for shifting toward imaging of postmortem specimens. Next I'll discuss our methods from receiving brain donations to preparing brains for MR scanning and I'll share with you some of the adventures I've had debugging and confronting the unique challenges that arise in postmortem imaging. And lastly, I'll present a case that we've scanned recently. Um, the reason I chose this case is that we actually have several in vivo MR scans in addition to high resolution scans that can demonstrate um, the information that can be gained from postmortem imaging compared to standard neuroimaging in living participants. All right, so let's begin. Um, I trust that the audience here will know more about Hunting's genetics, Huntington's genetics and pathology than I do, so I'll keep this portion brief. Um, the number of CAG repeats um, has a profound impact on an individual's age at motor symptom onset. When the number of repeats exceeds 60, um, onset tends to occur before the age of 21, which we refer to as juvenile onset. Um, with this early onset, um, it's been noted that there may be differences in the types of symptoms that individuals present with, while the predominant symptom in adult Huntington's is hyperkinesis with involuntary movements or chorea. Juvenile onset tends to have hypokinetic characteristics with prominent bradykinesia, bradykinesia or slowness of movement, stiffness and tremor, and may, may at times seem more uh, Parkinsonian in phenotype. Um, we don't currently have a great explanation for how these differences in pathology give rise to differences in age of onset or symptom patterns, um, but we do have a good sense of what the overall pathologies are in HD, which I'll go over now. Um, often considered the core pathological feature in Huntington's disease is the degeneration and near total loss of medium spiny neurons in the striatum. You can see in the image, uh, images on the, the right, um, the striatum is highlighted, as well as some medium spiny neurons. Um, but damage actually extends further than just the striatum. There's strong evidence that pathology extends to a patchwork of neurons in the cerebral cortex and is observed affecting a variety of neuron types, including pyramidal cells and interneurons. Um, likewise, uh, there's also strong evidence that uh, neurons in the cerebellum, particularly the large Purkinje neurons that line up at the boundary between the granular and molecular cell layers are also affected, as well as some of the nuclei or the neurons in the deep nuclei as well. Um, let's see. In order to bring this all together, I'm going to attempt to synthesize across a few different views of the pathogenic mechanisms of HD. We do know that normal Huntington is critical for normal brain development. Mutant Huntington has an impact even on early neural development affecting neuronal differentiation and neuronal migration, causing abnormalities in the normal cortical layering structure. Um, it is important to note that these processes are setting the stage for everything that follows in development and, and in the brain that in the rest of their lives. Um, it has been proposed that the uh, maladaptive cortical development is at the core of Huntington's pathology. Um, I realize I don't have the citation on this slide for a really good article on this topic, so my apologies to Carlos Cepeda and his group, um, who's the origin of these ideas. Um, there's good evidence that there's an imbalance between excitation and inhibition in the cortex in Huntington's disease. Um, if cortical layering is disrupted in utero, then the resultant miswiring of circuitry could certainly produce this hyperexcitatory imbalance. The result being an excess of glutamate release from hyperexcitable cortex. Um, the issues don't end there, however, as the hyperexcitability is likely to have further developmental repercussions. 
Um, we know that some very important stages of neurodevelopment are activity dependent. Initially, we grow too many neurons, we build too many synapses, and the ones that aren't useful die off or are pruned. Uh, Hyperexcitability may skew toward abnormally low pruning and less planned neuronal death. This would lead to abnormal developmental trajectories where affected brain regions might be expected to have abnormally large volumes. And indeed, this is what we observe in the striatum in young gene-expanded individuals. Um, as an example, kind of to simplify these concepts with an analogy, um, plants need sunlight to grow. Um, plants that get enough sunlight grow. Plants that don't die off. Now, if we consider the case where we add more light, at first, more plants can grow. However, things can start to go wrong. If we keep pouring on the sunlight, we can start causing damage, and essentially too much sunlight is gonna burn out the plants. Maybe there's too much plant for the so soil to support, and these plants start to, to die off. Um, and, and in the case of Huntington's, under this framework, we drag in the excitotoxicity hypothesis, whereby excessive levels of glutamate eventually kill neurons. For one reason or another, medium spiny neurons may be more susceptible to this imbalance from the cortex, may be sensitive to acute mutant Huntington toxicity, or simply due to the differences in cortical to cortical or cortical striatal circuitry. Um, this notion of circuits, however, highlights a further nuance that we need to consider. Brains are not isolated islands of information processing. Rather, they're integrated neural networks working in conjunction and in parallel. And pathological changes in activity will reverberate throughout the network, throughout networks throughout the brain. So the good news is, is that neural networks in the brain are remarkably resilient. When they're sufficiently mature, networks in the brain can maintain function even when a node or parts of a node break down. This is a phenomenon known as fault tolerance, which is, is a fancy way of saying that the system can continue to operate normally even when something goes slightly wrong. Um, fault tolerant operation is likely more stressful than normal operation because some nodes will have to pull double duty or do more work to make up for the lost processing. And this added stress can cause early degeneration. The catch is though, when fault tolerant mechanisms might fail, while initially they can make up for a deficit, the remaining failure can be rapid and cascade through multiple networks, um, which would manifest as relatively rapid degeneration. Critically, fault tolerant operation can only occur when nodes and connections between nodes are strong enough or mature enough to support this operation. Thus, fault tolerance capacity will increase dynamically throughout development. Thus, if uh, pathogenic uh, severity varies, for example, higher CAG repeat may mean larger hyperexcitability imbalance, the degeneration could occur before any fault tolerance uh, can occur, causing a dramatic shift in the expected age of onset, like we observe in JHD. Likewise, since fault tolerance capabilities alter how neural networks are stressed by local neuronal loss, the pattern of degeneration throughout the network might spread differently, potentially leading to different patterns of symptoms. So back to our framework, we need to consider adding an understanding of network effects. An important consideration is to acknowledge that trajectories, network maturity, and pathology will all interact and feed back to produce um, the phenotype of the disease. So returning to our plant example, this is where that kind of breaks down. Um, it would be as if photo-induced plant death would feed back and knock out the light source as well. So taken all together, this framework suggests that in order to improve our understanding of Huntington's disease pathology, we need to explore the whole brain to capture widespread brain networks, and we need to look in sufficient detail at features that capture pathological development. The laminar structures in the cerebral cortex and cerebellum may be excellent targets to begin this exploration. Um, these laminar structures in the human brain are actually very information rich. They directly reflect developmental processes, cell loss and damage to specific microstructural features, um, will disrupt laminar appearance, 
and laminar variation directly reflects uh, functional localization of cognition. So different regions with different laminar organization tend to have different functions. Um, unfortunately, laminar structure is not something we can easily image with standard neuroimaging. The resolution is just too low. Um, we can't keep people in a scanner for hours or, or days if we want to collect really high resolution images. And even if we could keep people in a scanner that long, it would be physiologically impossible to stay still enough. As you can see in this image here, there's there's micro movements due to just the, your your pul the wave of your blood pressure pulses going through your brain, um, and these these movements can be up to 400 microns um, in the cerebellum and other regions, and around like 70 microns in the cortex. Um, there are methods in development that might make um, re imaging at this resolution possible, um, but they're just not available yet. Um, by contrast, you might consider doing histological studies. Um, while these would be of more than sufficient detail, they're just too laborious uh, to be practical. At our current best, a study just released this past week from the uh, conjunction with the Brain Initiative. Uh, they mapped some like 2,100 neurons. Um, and let's say it took them about five years uh, during that uh, the brain initiative period to do. Um, if we were to map just the granular cells in the, in the cerebellum at this rate, it would take about 120 million years to complete the task. So clearly we just, we just can't do that sort of work um, at this sort of detail. So postmortem imaging can kind of can kind of come in and circumvent some of these limitations. Um, we can we can get the resolution that we need to see these cortical lamination. Um, we can forget about human factors. We don't have to worry about motion. Um, we don't have to destroy any of the tissue like we do with histology. We can slice and re-slice the data virtually. Um, it's easier to reconstruct than it is for slices because the, the uh, reconstruction is encoded in the acquisition. Um, we can, and we can collect data on the entire brain. We're not limited to, to doing a few sections or studying a few neurons. We can study across the entire brain volume. All right, so now I'll turn to how we actually do this sort of work. Um, the most critical step is acquiring donations. Um, we are 100% reliant on the generosity of the JHD community. Um, we collaborate with uh, Dr. Pegnapolis for local recruitment of donations, as well as our neurobank for storage and processing of each specimen. Um, I, I will put a little warning here. There's some images, images ahead that contain images of human tissue that may be considered graphic to some individuals. Um, so once a donor has passed, their brains are removed by a skilled pathologist and they're fixed in formalin for around 10 to 12 weeks. Um, if we're doing the extraction, we'll, we'll perform an intracarotid perfusion. So we'll, we'll actually pump uh, or drip perfusion right into the carotid artery. So it flushes out uh, all the blood out of the brain and allows, allows uh, fixation to reach deep tissues quicker. Um, otherwise, it's submerged in formalin fixed and shipped to us. So critically, fixation needs to penetrate into deep structures. Um, for example, this is a, an early pilot study we did with a cadaver. Um, and you can see an, a ring of uneven fixation inside the, inside the brainstem and thalamus. Um, okay. Uh, where am I? Um, once, it's, once the brain is fixed, we place it into a non-metallic container. Um, and then we seal the container tight with uh, silicone and make sure it's vacuum proof and waterproof. We don't want any liquids leaking out onto our expensive uh, MR scanners. Um, we let the silicone dry for about 24 hours. These, uh, these, this plastic bubble is actually a window you can put in your fence for a pet, um, but it's a perfect size to fit in our scanner. Um, and it contains the brain quite well. Um, after once contained, we'll put the brain uh, under a vacuum for 24 hours. This allows trapped air bubbles to expand and escape out of out of these trapped pockets. Um, this is probably the the most important step, and it really improves our image quality. Um, 
so if you take it as for example the same cadaver that I showed I showed um, you can see these black spots in the right hemisphere um, are uh, due to trapped air pockets in the vasculature this one this cadaver was perfused through the left carotid and so the and then the the formalin had to travel all the way through the body before it got to the left side um, so you can see that the the right side is free of air bubbles but you can see the air bubbles in the left um, after degassing we add a fluid media um, that has essentially no hydrogen atoms it's a fluorocarbon this uh, but it has similar magnetic properties to water um, this has benefits in uh, producing a black background whereas if we just scan it in water we get these artifacts where extreme like black and extreme light colors produ can produce these odd artifacts that uh, that corrupt our images and also just in terms of image processing this is one we actually embedded in an auger at, at an early attempt um, and you can see that it's just it's just difficult to differentiate the background from the the brain. So just to make our lives easier and later processing, um, we can we, having a black background makes things easier. Um, we then, once it's filled with liquid, we agitate for 24 hours. This is to ho hopefully wiggle out any trapped air pockets. Um, we'll keep it under vacuum at this time to keep the air keep air coming out. Um, and then we put it in the scanner. We do a quick scan to check for bubbles, repeat anything we need to, and let it come to the same temperature as the as the scanner. Um, I'll spare you some a lot of the details on here. The important takeaway is that standard T1 and T2 images don't provide tissue contrast as well as they do in vivo postmortemly. So we we turn to uh, susceptibility weighted sequences, which give us the resolution that we need or the tissue contrast that we need. Um, we also have to deal with uh, memory constraints on, on the scanner, um, so we can't actually require, acquire such full resolution images. We collect essentially thick slices, and then we shift our field of view and then stitch these all together offline um, and recombine to the full resolution image. So I'll now present our case. Um, so this was a young woman diagnosed in her teens with juvenile onset Huntington's disease. She took part in research at Iowa and we have scans for several time points during her life, spanning a period of five years. Her repeat expansion was 65. Um, in terms of cognition and behavior, they're what you might expect. She had bradykinesia at all visits um, with progressively worsening chorea. Generally, most measures declined over time as her disease progressed. So this is this is her brain that we uh, received before scanning, um, and it, you saw some of those images earlier. Um, it initially arrived with the meninges intact. Uh, however, with our bubble check, we found that there was a lot of trapped air pockets. So we brought it back out, took the meninges off, um, and cleaned it out that way. Um, so returning to in vivo, this is her brain approximately five years before before death. Um, this is an in vivo, so this is an in vivo T1 weighted scan. Um, and if we look, so this is a five years apart, same, the same individual. Um, you can see that on the left, um, it's a, it looks a lot more full. You can see a lot, a lot of kind of general atrophy over that five year period with the ventricles getting bigger, the sulci getting getting more pronounced. Um, it's a little bit a little bit difficult to see the striatum. There there is some change. However, um, it's it started off quite small once we first saw her. Um, importantly, we can go in and, and label all the tissue. Um, if you look closely, you can probably can probably get a sense that there's a lot less red relatively. Um, so the gray matter has thinned out. The the white matter, the green is relatively stable it, it looks there's not much white matter deterioration and we can also look a little more closely but in these overlays so what i've done is taken the five-year image in magenta and the prior image before that five her at her initial visit in green and overlaid them and you can see where we see green kind of in the ventricles there is 
the ventricles getting bigger, you can see the striatum getting smaller. And then on the right panel, these are Jacobian determinants. And what these do is provide a measure of how much uh, the, the each voxel had to move in order to get from one time to another. So this is going from the initial the intake scan to her, her five-year scan. And you can see the, the hotter colors correspond to areas that had a greater amount of shrinkage. I'm over time. Darn. Um, so we this is a primary visual cortex at, at our in vivo scan. Uh, as you can see, you can't see anything very well in terms of the cortical layering. Um, you can see uh, on our 300 micron scan postmortemly, you can see these strong bands, the tree of Janari. And we can go in and provide labels of these. So you can see all these different labels of cortex. And we can do this for the entire brain. Um, you can see here, you can see, the stri you can see the striatum, you can see different cortical regions, you can see the hippocampus. And we can go on and label the cortical layers across the whole brain. An important thing to note is the different thicknesses in different regions. So you can see in insula, you can see two main thick regions, whereas in visual cortex, you see multi multiple thinner layers. Now if we turn to the cerebellum on in vivo scans, you can't see much. It's even difficult to differentiate gray and white matter. Um, if you look at our 300 micron scan, you can differentiate the white matter fairly well, but it's difficult to see the layering. So we can go deeper in resolution to 150 micron scan. You can definitely see the molecular cell layer in the bright white, followed by the granular cell layer in kind of a medium gray, followed by the darker white matter. And again, we can go in and label all of these layers. And then from there, we can generate, reconstruct the 3D surface, we can generate thickness measures and quantify everything. Um, so just to reiterate, I think studying the whole brain across neurodevelopment is critical and post neuron imaging is a way that we can actually do, that, do this type of research. So I'd just like to quickly thank uh, all of the people I work with, uh, uh, Dr. Sipla Hefty and Lynn, um, who helped me work with all of these specimens, uh, my neuroimaging team, as well as uh, Dr. Napolis and Vince Magnata for their generosity and helping me work with this population and and Vince for all the free scanner time he's, he's uh, facilitated for me. And I'd be happy to take any questions. All right. Hello, everybody. I'd be happy to take any questions here. All right. So the first question we have, do we have any specific predictions about particular brain regions being affected? If so, which regions? Um, currently, we don't. That's something we're, we're working on. We don't have any specific predictions about uh, brain regions being involved, although we do think that... Um, the pattern of brain regions that will be affected will, will reflect the, the cognitive deficits that we see in each patient. So if we see um, a patient with, say, executive function deficits, th that'll be reflected by, like, say, frontal networks, or if they have emotional deficits, that'll be affected by uh, li limbic system or things like that. Um, next question. Um, have you ever tried to scan the brain of a cadaver post-mortem? Postmortem while it is still in the calvarium, what are the damages or disadvantages of doing this? Um, yes, and it, it has some unique challenges to um, to to scan like kind of in situ. Um, it's difficult to it's more difficult to get air out of the out of the brain cavity. So if there's any air trapped in the vessels, it's harder to 
put it under a vacuum to kind of suck those out, which is kind of uh, where we benefit with these extracted brains. It's not impossible when we're careful with their perfusion to kind of, if you, if you perfuse and clamp things down and don't let the fluid back out, it's possible to prevent air from getting in there. Um, it's just, it's, it's more difficult and harder to fix if it's in situ. Um, all right, next question. Uh, I would like to ask if the segmentation of the 70 has been validated in post-mortem non-HD subjects. Um, unfortunately, no, it has not been validated yet. That's something um, we're going to be actively working on. So the benefit of how we have these specimens, so we're going to be... Um, doing some validation in-house where once we have the, the them scanned to our liking, we'll have everything labeled and then we'll take uh, some slices through, throughout different parts of the brain and do uh, like a nissel stain or something where we can see these layers directly and compare the histology to the, to the actual brain. And we can do some like registration so we can bring those histological um, images into the space of the brain and we can calculate like dice coefficients with the uh, overlap between the the uh the different modalities there hang on sorry i'm just trying to sort through the questions here uh how would you Link neuropathology to neuroimaging results. So, so as I was uh, just mentioning, so the one one of the things that we do is, is we would try to register everything into a common space. So we would actually bring the histology into this whole brain space and map um, those histo histological images into the into the brain space. Um, and we can do this. One of the ways to do this is you can, as long as you you kind of photograph and keep track of everything as you go along. You can kind of stitch things back together and register the parts back into the hole. Oh. What might the differential effects of fixation on different cell types or regions influence interpretation of your findings? Um, that's a good question. I don't know. I'm not, I don't really know much about, uh, differential fixation by cell type, to be honest. Um, I think what we see per voxel, so there's still like 100 microns on at least on either side. So it's going to be aggregated across quite a few cells. Um, so I would think that a lot of those would wash out. We do see if we don't, if we scan too early and it hasn't fixed enough, you'll, you'll see those artifacts um, where you can clearly see a, a line of different tissues fix it, fixed at different amounts. So you'll see like the inner regions will be brighter. Um, essentially the, the relaxation times for the scanner, they go there, they go way up initially. So they're a lot faster. So the, the signal um, changes more quickly initially in, in fixing tissue, and then it'll drop slowly over time. And we want to wait till it's kind of leveled off and, evened out. Um, the particular sequence we use here is sensitive to kind of that micro environment uh, of, of each voxel. So kind of what the magnetic susceptibility is in that region. So it's going to be, it's actually more sensitive to things like, like iron um, and things like that. So if you look at the, I don't know if you can still see the slide, but in the dentate gyrus, it's quite a dark region. Um, that's because there's there's some iron deposition in that region. Uh, how do I segment the scan? Um, that is a good question. <laughs> we we are trying a whole bunch of different ways. We're trying we're adapting some methods um, in FreeSurfer right now. So essentially, the way FreeSurfer works is uh, you, it takes like the, a map of the white matter surface and it pushes out until it hits a certain contrast boundary and then it'll call that the peel layer and so we can manipulate the intensity of these images so that it hits like so it's in the cerebellum if it's going from the white matter we can manipulate it so it hits that molecular cell layer 
and then we can do it repeat it again so it hits the the granular or the granular cell layer and then the molecular cell layer so kind of iterate through like a free server type workup um, how do you maintain the shape of the brain during fixation that's another good question so we um we we, we do our best it's, it it does get distorted um, we, we place it in like a hairnet and hang it upside down to prevent uh, any crushing of the brain or minimize crushing of the brain stem and allow it to um, be somewhat supported. Um, but there's, there's always going to be some shrinkage and just distortion because it's so soft. Um, that's uh, doing any sort of shape analysis is going to be, be, I don't know, probably unreliable in these sources. Um, how I think that's all the questions I have. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. I appreciate you uh, taking the time to listen to my talk.